So I, I uh, didn't introduce Mike, but I asked him, um, we're going to have some more story sharing about what's going on in our wider ministries here at Bethany on a regular basis so you know what's going on because there's some powerful things happening. And, and then specifically, how what Mike shared ties in with this new sermon series and how um, we're called as God's people to embrace yet. You also got a little glimpse of this from uh, Freddie up here being baptized just a little while ago about how God um, not just um, works in incredible ways, but calls all of us to embrace, uh, embrace yet. And when, when I say that, you're like, what in the world is Pastor talking about? Well, this is, this is an important question, a really important question. And um, so I'm going to define this for you. So the new sermon series is Embrace Yet. And what is the yet that I'm talking about? It's the missing elements in our lives. It's the part of you that you wish you had more of. It's wishing we could have more prayer circles. It's looking at our lives and, and it's definitely not kumbaya all, all the time. I think you understand what I'm talking about. So it's the missing elements in every human being. It's also the hope that God pours into us. Right? Because not only is life filled with moments of frustration, and as I shared with Freddie earlier, darkness, it also has great light. And God brings that light to us. We see this at Bethany all the time. Okay? So, so for example, in preschool, we have kids that come in who, who barely know letters, some not at all. And, and, and majority of which have never heard about Jesus. At least not yet. We have middle schoolers who don't yet know how to manage what it looks like to organize themselves so they can handle the craziness of high school. We talked about Lutheran West earlier. They don't know how to do that. And, and they also struggle to, to apply the core teachings of our faith to their lives. Well, at least not yet. Or think about the uh, empty nester, children out of the house, and man, these families are so different that we see coming around, they just live differently, they make different decisions, and you know, I don't even know how to respond in a helpful way for people that are, that are wandering, trying to make it through life, and they don't seem to really value church at all. Well, we don't know yet. See what I'm saying? What about the elderly woman who is struggling, struggling, struggling because her body is failing her, and she is just feeling like there's this major hole in her life. She can remember all the, the great memories from when she was younger, when she was more vibrant, and now my body's just failing me, and she just doesn't know how God fills that hole. At least not yet. To embrace yet looks like this. It's to lean into our incompleteness with Christian hope. You see, there's a tension there. It's to lean into the, the, the aspects of our lives which we wish were better, which we wish were more complete. It's leaning into it, not pushing it on the rug, not shoving it to the side, but leaning into it with the hope that Jesus provides each and every day. And then what happens, the more we learn to lean into incompleteness and finding completeness ultimately in Jesus, the more we find strength and, and the courage to bring hope to the incompleteness that we see in others. We find this actually, this image, at the very beginning when God created the world. Genesis 131a, I'm going to actually, I'll tell you what that 131a is. Um, open up your pew Bibles to page 1. I can help you find it. I can go round. 1. 1. You remember that? 1. Okay. It's very easy. It's kind of fun. I honestly want to pick a reading from page one just so I could say page one. <gasps> Lisa just told me it's actually page two. I stand corrected. Flip the page, guys. Flip the page. Pastor should have studied his page numbers better. Page two. Sorry. Oh. Well, we're going to have to go... Maybe I'm just going to make you read something on page one for fun. All right, uh, 31a, let's read this together. 31a. And God saw everything he made, and behold, it was very good. That's A. All right. <laughs> God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was good. In the beginning, God created. Do you remember uh, how he created everything? Spoke it into existence. He created everything, and after he created everything, what did he say? It is it is good. It's interesting, though, when you actually read Scripture. So now you look at, or if you actually do look at page 1, chapter 1 of the Bible 
is like the picture of creation on a cosmic level. Like, so looking at it from the big picture, from God's perspective. He created everything. He created the first man, the first woman. And then he did it all, and then he, and then he rested on day seven. And then you get to chapter two, and, and you have some things happening again. It's almost like you zoom in on chapter two on creation from a human perspective. And it's fascinating then. So you get, you get the human perspective while creation is still kind of in process here. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. We're going to read verse 15 through 17 together. All right? So that is also page 2. Here we go. <laughs> we read together. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay, so God created and he even says work is good. So he created the first human being. So that's Adam, the first man. Go work. Now this is what's fascinating though. Let's let's read verse 18 together then. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So it is not good that the man should be by himself. So this is in the middle of creation. So God's creating everything. It's good, it's good, it's good. He creates the first human being. He's like, wait, 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 wait. It is not good that man should be alone. And so what does he do? He creates the first woman. Ladies, you complete us. I had to say it, sorry. Um, Day seven. What did Jesus do? What did God do on day seven? He rested. See, day seven is when everything was complete. The number seven throughout Scripture, if you ever see the number seven come up, it means completion. So things weren't complete. It wasn't good. It wasn't complete until there was relationship. And it's interesting that when God rested, everything was good and complete. Isn't that what we all long for? To be able to rest our head at the end of the day and it's all done. Does anybody ever do that? It's part of living in a sinful world. Living in a sinful world, we struggle because alone is incomplete. We're busy doing lots of things on our own. You see, it wasn't complete. The world wasn't complete until God created relationships. Alone represents a void. Being alone is it means you're missing something. Now, in this passage, in, in Genesis 2, 18, what God is doing is he's creating the institution of marriage. So this is fascinating. Do you know what God built the world on? He didn't build, like he didn't say, we're going to start a democracy, or we're going to start a totalitarian dictatorship, because that sounds like fun. Right? I mean, honestly, that would actually work if the person leading had a pure heart. <laughs> but we don't live in that world. God didn't create a government, he created Marriage. And I want you to think about this. How our lives are impacted for the good and also in not so good ways through the relationships of the people who raise us. And how the people are impacted by us, the people that we are raising, if, you are, if you're a married couple, for example. But maybe you're an unmarried person in this room and you're like, well, hold on a second. How does this apply to me? Because, okay, I'm not married. You know, I'm, I'm too young. I'm like in third grade or I'm in high school. You know what? What are you talking about, pastor? Like, how does this help? Or you might just say, I'm single or I'm, I'm widowed or I'm divorced. Well, this applies to you too. Because on a deeper level, what's being talked about here is that we were designed for human relationship. So you were designed to have a family, even if it's a, an adoptive family. You, God wants you to have friendships, people that are going to seek your good. He wants you to be part of a church, a body of believers where he's at the center. That's how we're built. That's how we're designed. And anything aside from that, apart from that, is not good. And it's going to be incomplete. And this is why. Alone makes it hard to hope. Isn't that true? Alone is, gives you a feeling of hopelessness sometimes. See, by himself, just the first man right there, creation wasn't done. It was just incomplete. Humanity couldn't multiply. That's one thing for sure. But he didn't have all the gifts that was needed to do the work. He needed a helper, a complement, somebody that would make him a greater whole. And then it would be complete. 
And we see this in our own lives. We don't have, each of us, all the gifts. We have incompleteness within us because of our sinful nature, because we are designed in a way where we might be really good at that, but not very good at that. And nobody in this room is a very good savior. That's 100% true. Now, one of the things that I reflect on when I think about this alone makes it hard to hope. I can't imagine how hard it is to be a single parent. I can't imagine. I've talked to a lot of single parents. And I always leave those conversations being completely humbled because I know how hard it is being a married, a married man with three children, and it can be hard doing that alone. I've heard the comment, how can I keep this up? And my honest thoughts are, man, I don't know how you do it. Think of a student struggling with their work. Could be high school, could be grade school. I'll never get this done. If any of you have ever had a, had a, a young one in your house up till like 11 o'clock, like starting to hit things or throw things because it's like, I don't get it. Figure it out. <laughs> you know, I mean, alone, we're kind of hopeless. And so where does the conversation off, often go? Have you talked to your teacher? Can I help you? See? And just that, just that little bit gives you a glimmer of hope. Gives them a glimmer of hope. Because alone, when we're alone, hope is hard. But the beauty of Scripture is this. See, in the beginning, God created the first human being. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. So what did he do? He created woman. He created a relationship. He offered grace, you could say small g, grace, by providing what was needed. But in Jesus, we have something even better. It can be daunting to start a new day, right? It can be hard. Yet God calls us to lean into the things that are incomplete and find fulfillment in Jesus. We don't have prayer circles every day like that. It teaches you when you have moments like what Mr. Sheeman shared just a little while ago to embrace those moments because this is what we long for. This is what we want to see in the next generation. This is what we want to see in our lives where we're leaning into our incompleteness but not doing so in a hopeless way, doing so knowing that there is hope. We're not by ourselves. We need to confess to God that we often insist on doing things by ourselves. I can do it. I don't need help. And besides, to ask for help, well, that shows weakness. Actually, to ask for help is a sign of strength. It's admitting that I do need others. It's admitting that alone is often hopeless. It's admitting that it is not good, it is not complete until I have a helper. That's strength, my friends. Flip the script here a little bit. Because the world keeps telling you, you can do it, you can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, you can make it. But Jesus says, no, you're not designed to do it by yourself. That's why I had to come. Hear Jesus' words. Actually, first hear God's words at creation. It is not good that you should be alone. And then hear the words that Peter read just a little while earlier from Matthew 28. Jesus saying to his disciples, I am with you to the end of the age. I am with you. Your Savior gave up the beauty of heaven for the horror of the cross. But he did that so that you would find completion in him. In Christ, you are no longer inadequate. You're simply a sinner who has been claimed as a child and you rest in the Father's hands. You can be secure in Him. In Jesus, you're no longer a failure. Your work will always be incomplete, this side of heaven. But Jesus' work, His work on the cross was fully complete. What did Jesus say when He gave His life? He said, it is finished, complete, rest. I don't know if some of you remember this last week. I, I had you stand up and then I said, put your hands out like this. Receive. Receive. Is this hard? Is your brain already spinning to what you need to do? 
They need to be still. Breathe and receive. It is finished. His work is sufficient. You are not alone. And when you come to worship and you receive his grace, that is what you're remembering every single time. You are not alone. No matter what season of life you find yourself in, no matter what circumstances, what situation, in whatever aloneness and incompleteness you feel like you have in your life, you are not alone. You have a friend who gave his life for you. Hope is an ever-present daily reality. Jesus to you means that even death itself is not the end. Nothing can take that away from you. Hope is an ever-present reality. Embrace it. It changes the way you look at life. It allows you to rest. You know, I had a lot uh, going on in my life when I started college. I was thinking about this, actually. Today is like a lot of kids are going to college for the first, for first month. There's, there's a bunch. Um, as a college student, I was living away from my home for the first time. Didn't have any friends at all. Didn't know anybody um, at college. And my roommate situation was really rough. In fact, the roommates I had were more interested in partying than even getting to know me. They were gone half the time. And at the very same time, my dad, like only about three weeks earlier, had been diagnosed with stage four cancer. I was alone. It was hard. It was a tough time in my life. I had a lot of holes. It wasn't my idea of the college life. But I forced myself to go to freshman camp. Yay, freshman camp! You know, I was kind of like, cool people don't go to freshman camp. You don't do that, right? Went. And I met um, a guy named Caleb. And we got to know each other. And he started calling me when we got back from camp. Hey, going to lunch? I was eating by myself. So he'd call me every time he was going to lunch. Then he introduced me to the guys on his floor. They became really good friends of mine. He even encouraged me every once in a while. He'll admit to it wasn't every week, but every once in a while he'd say, Vogel, we're getting up for church. Caleb actually came by a couple months ago and I showed him Bethany. <laughs> it's kind of cool. I believe Bethany is calling us to be a little bit like Caleb. To be like my friend. To be a community where nobody is left alone. Do you know somebody who's interested in the faith? Who could use a little extra encouragement? Do you know somebody who feels like they're by themselves? Yesterday was cold, so I know why some people maybe didn't come out, but we had a great event yesterday. Parking lot was full of kids. Yeah, I got dunked in the dunk tank, but it was such a cool opportunity to get to know people, to socialize, to see the work that God is doing in our school ministry, but, but in our wider community. We had people in our neighborhood come to this event. It was pretty cool. It was awesome. It was a lot of fun. I was a little tired afterwards, but it was fun. There are opportunities in our community, right here at Bethany, to embrace yet. To embrace that reality that nobody needs to be left alone. Uh, we got a new event coming up called Servant Saturday in October. I would encourage you to check it out. It doesn't matter what stage of life in, what your capabilities are, what age you are. We want everybody to participate. Let's embrace the people God places in our lives. Let's embrace other people. This side of heaven, there's always going to be things that are incomplete. But in Jesus, we have all we need. Let's share that with others. In Jesus' name. Amen. In response to God's love for us, we now...